Hey everyone, and welcome to a new, another week of OSHIP. Uh, this week, I'm joined by a new friend called Vivek Vejad, and he's the co-founder, general partner, and CTO of Superset. Now, if you've never heard of Superset, they're a startup studio that actually focuses on founding uh, and building data-driven software companies. So Vivek was the CTO of Salesforce Marketing Cloud, the co-founder of Crux, which was sold to Salesforce, and worth noting was also a Chameleon Collective client at one point. Uh, prior to that, he was the CTO of Wrapped, a media monetization software that was sold to Microsoft. Uh, he's even the co-author of Data Driven, Harnessing Data and AI to Reinvent Customer Engagement, which was published in 2018. And I think that Vivek is one of those people that's just been sitting at the forefront of technology for a long time which is why he's perfect to discuss what it means to build a business in a data and AI driven world, given that that is such an incredibly interesting and hot topic right now. And with that, here we go with another week of OSHIP. Vivek, welcome to OSHIP. How are you? I'm great, Freddie. Thank you for having me on the show. Looking forward to uh, our conversation. My pleasure. I've been di dying to pick your brain. I've been, you know, I, I've been uh, geeked out on so many AI, AI conversations lately with friends and colleagues uh, that I keep thinking that, okay, I, I, I could pick a, a, a real wizard's uh, uh, brain soon, uh, given how much you uh, spend thinking about um, you know, this, this kind of world. Um, you know, I did my best to to kind of give a, a fair intro for Superset, but it'd be really helpful if you told our audience a little bit more about uh, what you guys are doing. Yeah, of course. Before I get into what Superset is doing, I will tell you, Freddie, that expectations reduce joy. So, uh, you know, any any high expectations expectations you may have about uh, insights in the eye, temper them down. Uh, <laughs> Well, I think it's hard. It's hard to know anything. It's hard to know what, where it's going to go out there. But I think you know, yeah. you 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 got a good a good sense of you know the pulse of data driven companies. So I'm looking forward to geeking out on this subject with you. Yeah, me too. Me too. So just digging in, Superset is a startup studio that founds, funds, and builds data driven software companies. Uh, my co-founder Tom Chavez and I we've been working together for just over 23 years now. Wow. And uh, we were together at Rap, then at Crux, and now uh, Superset. And along the way, we've built uh, a, a couple of data-driven companies. And we've we developed uh, some expertise in not just the product and, and technology aspects, but also how to take these companies to market, the go-to-market aspect of building these companies too. So we were very fortunate that uh, we had a group of people at Crux slash Salesforce after the acquisition who were still eager to work together. And uh, when Tom and I decided to do something new, we had this, this problem of plenty, if you will, where people were asking us, hey, when are we doing the next thing? And uh, we, everybody had grown. You know, the directors were ready to become VPs and the VPs were ready to become co-founders. Right. And so we had this, 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 this abundance of talent that uh, that we we, ha we had to work with, and so That's we uh, and we had to be toying toying around with this idea of building and starting multiple companies because we're company builders at heart and and we love entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. So we decided to create the studio, and literally we had four ideas that we were kind of sort of toying with, and we split the pe the number of people into four groups and launched four companies. That's how the That's studio awesome. was born. First of all, I think it's really cool that you've got a, you know, kind of a partner in crime that you've worked with for so long that, uh, you know, it's like uh, your, your, your uh, uh, work soulmate, so to speak. So I think it's cool that you guys were able to do that. And I think it's even cooler. That, and I think it says a lot about, um, you know, you as a leader and as founder that you, you've got this kind of, you know, web of people that are like, hey, where we, where, I don't know where we're going, but let's all go someplace together. And I think that's pretty awesome. Yeah. Well, we're very lucky in that regard. Very, very lucky in that regard. And now, are you, you've got of the, so are there more than four now? Oh, yeah, we have uh, 10 and an 11th one is a Bruin right now. Wow, very uh, cool. And they're all at different stages. So, so the earlier ones, uh, some of them have gone on race series B, some of them did big series A's, some of them, uh, the, the second cohort, if you will, uh, did seed rounds and, and they've just done um, C plus or, or C plus rounds. 
and uh, other, the others are just starting out. So, uh, so yeah, we have companies in all of the different along the spectrum, so to speak. Very cool. And, and so, what what makes you love data driven software? You know, beyond your background, like there's clearly a re- there's there's a passion that's evident here, in my opinion. Yeah, I think the problems uh, of that that come from that stem from data driven software are are very interesting. You know, the uh, if you look along the way. At Wrapped, when we were building um, supply chain optimization or pricing optimization software, we started off in high tech, uh, in the high tech vertical. So companies like Sun, HP, Intel, Apple, etc., were our customers. And then we pivoted and adopted and ad- adopted adapted the technology for media. And so most of the large publishers were our customers. Uh, the volume and velocity of data that people talk about the four V's of data the amount of data we were processing in the late 90s, early aughts, you compare that to today, it was a, it was like, it's a night and day in terms, of, in terms of scale. And therefore, the technologies that you need to develop to, to solve the same problem have just exploded and have evolved uh, over the last 20 years or so. So that keeps my job interesting. You know, even now between when we were doing Crux, right, and now, we, we were one of the earlier adopters of platforms like Hadoop and, and AWS. And now those names are, Hadoop is, is not quite dead, but it's obsolete now. People have moved on to yeah. things like Spark and Ray and Dask and platforms yeah. like that. So this innovation is just, it keeps happening. And uh, for us, uh, application slash infrastructure slash services like company builders, the, uh, availability of this kind of technology to solve data-driven problems is just more and more, it gets more and more exciting every day. You know, sometimes when you, I think you talk to your average person and you start talking about the concept of data, I think that it can feel very technical. It can feel kind of impersonal. Uh, is there is there a humanity or a beauty to data in your opinion as someone who you know, is clearly so passionate about it? Well, I th- yes, absolutely. I think that that uh, ultimately what you are trying to do is get the data to speak to you, right? You are looking for patterns. You're looking for insights. You're looking for, for answers to questions that you might have. So your job as a, uh, whether it's a data analyst or a data scientist or a software engineer who's building applications using data, mm-hmm. your job is to give people the tools that they can use to get answers to these questions. Yeah. And, and sometimes, you know, you are yourself a user, like as a, as a software engineer building distributed systems, you are looking at observability data. How are my services doing? What went wrong? And, and oh, the customer reported an issue. How do I go find out where exactly this issue came from? That's a data discovery, data mm-hmm. analysis problem, because you're looking at logs that were produced by your application Mm. And there could be gigabytes and petabytes of these logs. Mm. And you now have to go uh, spelunking, right, yes. <laughs> uh, with, uh, with whatever tools you have to get insights and get the data to speak to you to give the answers to questions yeah. you have. I love this con- the, when you start thinking about these insights and you talk about the size of some of these data sets that are out there now. I think one of the things that's really interesting when you if you're just self-reflecting on this kind of like the humanity of data I think there's things that we we think a personal answer is a one to one answer. It's my it's my opinion or this feeling I have about myself or this situation or something that I'm behavior that I'm exhibiting. But actually, there's something I think about when you look at really large subsets of data that bring out um, universal human truths, stuff yes. that you know that like that like the consistency tells a, 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 a um, almost like a can can tell a more. I'm not saying always, but can tell more accurate. I think perception of you know uh, who we are, what anything is, uh, when you really kind of abstract things out, and uh, I think there's something really beautiful about that and really interesting. Yeah, no, I think that's that's spot on, and and yeah. it's a technique that that uh, most analysts or scientists use as well. Like they, it's it's very hard to to uh, model a single individual's behavior. Yeah. Um, right. And so you, you think in terms of cohorts and then and then you go backwards and forwards. You think in terms of cohorts, you get some insight and then you 
And when you apply that insight to the individual to uh, give that individual a sense of uniqueness, um, you know, my Spotify recommendation, my Spotify playlist that Spotify recommends for me is different from yours. But yeah. I'm, I'm, I bet you that there are certain aspects of music that are common to us. Maybe yeah. the specific artists that we like are different, but hey, we might, we might still like 70s rock and roll. You know? I'm more um, like a early '90s European polka scene. Is that not what oh, you're okay. into? No, that's not. No, then we will have very different. Uh, <laughs> Damn it, algorithms. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you know, again, you have such a cool background, and you've worked with some really big names in tech. Both, I think, merging through them as as you know, startup owner and, and founders, but then you're know, having to operate in some pretty big businesses, um, to put it mildly. Um, so I feel like now being knee deep in the startup studio is a really interesting flip for you. Um, and I'm going to ask this question a couple different ways from different angles, just forewarning you. Um, what are some of the most important lessons that you've taken from some of the big companies that you've now been exposed to um, and that you try and help bring to some of these earlier uh, startup founders to help them consider as they're birthing these companies? Yeah, you know, it's a great question. You know, w one of the things that I've come to appreciate a lot, right, is the power of distribution. As as technologists, we are very quick to uh, get caught up in, oh, look, we're solving this cool problem using this really wonderful solution that we came up with. All of it is not is is for naught if you can't figure out how to market it and sell it to your customers. And that's one thing we learned uh, at Salesforce in spades. Like Salesforce has really nailed what we call the distribution problem, where starting from how do you discover customers for your solution to how do you create a uh, plan and a whole program to uh, guide them through this, this funnel, if you will, and then, and then turn, turn these prospects into customers. So the power of distribution is one thing that we've learned at big companies that I've learned at big mm -hmm. companies like Salesforce mm -hmm. in particular, which we, which we, and those lessons we've taken to heart. Like we, uh, we start with the go-to-market aspect right from day zero mm -hmm. as we are starting and building these companies, starting with who's the customer? How are we going to sell to them? How do we, mm -hmm. how do we find out what problems they care about? Forget the technology. Let's focus on the problems we're trying to solve and forget the how. Let's focus yeah. on the what. These are types of so things. Sell, that, was it, sell, sell the hole, not the drill uh, kind of correct. thinking. Yeah. Correct. And then I think I, and the, the other thing that, that I learned uh, at Salesforce is the power of people. You know, the, we, now we say at Superset, people, product, customers. Salesforce is a great company to work for, right? Uh, and they, they do pay asymmetric attention to, to the people aspect. And mm. I benefited from that. And, and so that's another learning that, uh, that we took away uh, in the startup studio. The, the, you know, this kind of concept of starting with the customer, I think one of the problems when you deal with um, engineering-led founders as well, sometimes you can get really focused on the tech and you become a solution in search of a problem. You're like, man, this yep. is so cool. But like, does it solve, um, you know, a, a meaningful problem for people? Have you ever had to... Um, do you feel like you've had to course correct some, any founders you've worked with over the years to kind of help them to see that big picture? No, not at Superset. Um, That's good. And, and, and the reason for that, Freddie, is we, when we build companies, right? So mm -hmm. we're a startup studio. Uh, we have a fund that we use to make seed investments in the studio, in the mm -hmm. studio but that's a secondary thing. Um, but if you were a VC firm, mm -hmm. VCs write investment memos. Right. Mm -hmm. So within the partnership, they'll write a memo about, oh, I'm, I'm trying to uh, invest. I want to invest in company X. And mm -hmm. here are the parameters. And here's a memo I'm going to write to convince mm -hmm. the partnership of why it's good for us to invest in this company mm -hmm. X. Mm -hmm. At Superset, we write solution memos. And mm -hmm. the solution memo is actually an articulation of the customer, the mm -hmm. pain point the customer is facing and how we might address that pain point through a solution that we will build. And then more importantly, what we do is we kind of lay out the roadmap for staging and sequencing. This is where the company is going to go. In the here and now, in stage mm -hmm. one, we're going to do X. 
Well, it sounds like you're co-creating as well, which is really helpful. So, yeah. And so you don't have to course script because you were in the trenches with them helping making sure they consider this through the learnings you've, you've accumulated. Correct. And that the other benefit of that is, is, and we're seeing this right now with some companies as they, as they grow and and go on to raise series A, series B, et cetera, right. We're we're on the board and, and we, we are, uh, we're on, we're advisors to them, et cetera, but they can reach out to us as operators as well because we had been in the trenches with them earlier when we were building the company initially so there is that 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 trust that is built where they can kind of ask us to put on our builder or co-founder hats on Mm -hmm. and work with them through whatever it is that they are going through a new product initiative some strategic changes they want to make how Mm -hmm. to acquire a new set of customers in another vertical whatever the issue might be we can engage with them as builders and not just board members slash investors as well. I love that. Yeah, so I want to flip this question on it on its head for a second. So I think one of the things that's interesting when you um, when you can get in these bigger and bigger companies, you know, uh, obviously all, uh, all this, these tech startups, I use Microsoft as an example, obviously famously kind of started in a you know garage type type mentality, and then all of a sudden you're you know this behemoth of a, of a business. And I think sometimes it's possible for um, things to kind of get um, lost along the way. You know, even though they say, hey, we've got this entrepreneurial DNA and they want to feel that way, the bureaucracy and the hierarchy and the infrastructure and all that starts to get in the way of all that. So um, now that you've been back in the startup game, so to speak, and you reflect back on and on some of the things you saw, and obviously I'm not looking for you to be critical of some clearly amazing places to work. But do you think there's anything that, you know, even if you want to count as generalization, some of the things that you feel like gets lost in the mix at the bigger companies? Yeah, a couple of things. One, uh, there is not as much appetite to take a risk. Uh, So whether it's, you know, with a new product launch or a new set of features that you want to launch in an existing product, the the risk appetite isn't the same at a big company and perhaps that's understandable, right? The second thing is, is you have to work really hard to make the case for a new product. And unless it's going to generate hundreds of millions of dollars of revenue very quickly, it's, it, it doesn't uh, meet the bar, so to speak. Mm. Right. Is this, Whereas, why they, is this why they just acquire, they acquire the early stage ones and roll them in basically. Correct. Correct. I mean, yeah. th- 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 there's a lot of that, that kind of thinking that goes on uh, in, in the pro- in, in the companies uh, like that. It's uh, and well, but, but the way now on the outside, I look at it as, hey, that's opportunity, you know, for uh, for people like us to build uh, to build companies and whatnot. The other thing that that kind of gets in the way, and I experienced this myself uh, to a large degree, is that the decision making machine is operates very slowly, mm. right? And so even though you would have aligned on, okay, yep, we agree, this is what we need to do, actually making it so on that decision takes a much longer time than you would have expected. Mm. And, uh, and so those are like three things that, so, uh, that I think are, are different or get in the way really of, mm. of big companies trying to build innovative products uh, mm-hmm. themselves. Yeah. It's uh, I, I, now, now that you've kind of, you know, been flipping back and forth between the two, do you think if you're, do you, do you think you enjoy the, the earlier part of the business building or do you, or do you like the, the later stage scaling more just personally? Look, I, I think that I love both. I love the entire yeah. company building journey, right? I'm making and you pick between so, like two children right now. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's, it's, it's fine. Like it's, uh, it's, I, I never thought that I was the kind of person who would relish these problems that come out when you are operating at scale, number yeah. of customers, you know, as your, num- as your cus- number of customers grows, you know, you start to hear different types of things from different customers. You have issues across multiple customers. They all have different priorities and different roadmaps for success and whatnot. And then you need to innovate too, right? I was more like, okay, we have this problem. Let's go build some software to solve it and then yeah. move on to the next thing, yeah. right? Uh, I've realized that 
there's a lot of joy in in the whole journey and and when you especially when you've been through it once or twice like like I have yeah. right you you come to the other end and you're like wow we built something great and impactful and uh we were very lucky at crux that we had a lot of customers who who came on board with us in the early early stages who trusted us uh frankly i don't know why uh but i'm i'm sure i'm sure glad they did right and they were customers throughout and 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 with their friends now and it was that whole journey you know wouldn't have happened if i was just interested in one aspect and not the other So I relish it all, Freddie. I relish it. I think there's not, not, nothing wrong with that. I, I'm an e- equal opportunity lover of great fun projects as well. So no, no <laughs> judgment. <laughs> so, um, so speaking of uh, fun projects, um, you know, it's been obviously all over the uh, really hot and heavy on the news cycle lately. Obviously, everyone chatting about AI. Uh, I think it's impossible to, t- to start talking about AI or start talking about the you know, giant subsets of data that these AI uh, you know, tools are trained on. And I'd just love to get your um, just general feeling on, you know, what do you, what do you think of it all? How much of it is hype? How much of it is real? You know, what excites you? Just, just give me, give me your, give me your download. Yeah. Look, the, the kind of stuff that we've been able to do with, with machine learning uh, in the last five years or so is just amazing. Right. And and it's it's funny we're having this conversation right now where uh, a few, you know, we, it's been a few months since the launch of chat GPT and and the results that chat GPT is throwing out in terms of uh, giving us answers to questions and, and, and whatnot. It's just mind blowing. Right. Um, the it's 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 passing it's writing essays and, and and writing answers to questions posed in exams at mba schools and, and whatnot and getting ex- excellent grades uh, for whatever it's worth so it's uh the 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 potential for for it all is just is just mind blowing right all the all the work that's going on in self driving cars and and uh, and all of that it's just it's amazing marketing at, and advertising has been the beneficiary of of mach- uh for quite some time now but i'm actually very excited to see the applications of machine learning and ai in uh industries that are not mainstream or not considered mainstream and sexy like logistics and supply chain and and, and healthcare even uh mm. although there are some very interesting applications in healthcare that have come out in the last five years or so but uh look the potential is 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 awesome right uh and it needs to be balanced with this with this mindset that it's not a panacea ai is not a panacea right you still have to be thoughtful about how you are going to take these solutions out to market uh as we've seen with chat gpt it's not perfect uh, it sometimes spits out garbage um and that's okay but so so there's always this 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 notion of augmented intelligence you know not artificial but augmented intelligence where you use the ai as a tool to to make, to do your job better or to do whatever it is it is you're trying to do better right uh google maps or are uh, is a great example of that right i love google maps i'm in awe of the system that they've built to give me directions to go from mm-hmm. anywhere to anywhere there is a lot mm-hmm. of ai in there uh mm-hmm. too and to your point about data they are learning every single microsecond from the data that they collect mm-hmm. of every trip that is navigated via google maps right yeah. so i have i'm very excited about the possibilities mm-hmm. uh but i'm also a pragmatist uh and and cognizant of the challenges that come with widespread adoption of ai and learning from large data sets is one of them mm-hmm. and uh uh like one of our companies catch where i'm involved in is building a data control data privacy compliance solution how do you how do you give users or owners of data the ability to control who can access data for what purpose yeah. right these are the kinds of things that are going to become more mainstream as ai becomes more and more mainstream and part of our lives i, I want to talk about the the data set issue for a moment but i do really quickly just want to acknowledge um about two minutes ago you you criticized some of the writing that chat gpt uh put out and i just want to say looking straight in the camera 
Uh, Mr. ChatGPT, when you do become self-aware, I just want to be clear in saying I, I didn't criticize anything that you did. I think you're great. That was my friend. So when you're singling us out, that was him, not me. I think you're amazing and everything you do is awesome. Okay. So I just felt for my own safety that I would just put that disclaimer Well done, Freddie. <laughs> well done. <laughs> I mean, I don't want to think I'm pandering to you, Mr. ChatGPT, should you review this video in the future. <laughs> which, which it will. <laughs> it will. So on that note, all jokes aside, um, so you've got uh, you, you know you you've got these data sets that people are analyzing, and I think when you start looking at things like Chat GPT, uh, you know it's saying it's you know accumulating you know millions and millions, potentially trillions in the future. I heard rumors of you know data points that are out there, and so uh, you could argue that everyone could start analyzing these same data points and start accumulating you know, comparable sets of data. What is the opportunity from, uh, from a data expertise standpoint for like different companies to glean different opportunities from potentially what becomes a pretty singular homogenous data set in, in the future? Assuming yeah, everything- Yeah, no, it's a great question. Tested. It's a great question. And it's something that we think about a lot in our shop over here, Freddie. Um, so you're right. You know, chat GPT or foundational models like GPT-3 are trained on just massive data sets. Mm -hmm. The average company like cannot cannot even fathom how how much compute resources it takes to train models like that. Mm -hmm. Right. So we are going to continue to see more of that happening from these big companies. Meta, Google, OpenAI with the investment that Microsoft is making in them, etc., so there will be these foundational models that are trained on wide publicly available mammoth data sets, right? Mm -hmm. The opportunity is in, uh, and everybody will, access, will have access to those foundational models. Mm -hmm. The opportunity and the approach that people are going to take now is uh, what some people are calling data centric AI. What we, how we internalize that is you start with a foundational model and then you fine tune it using data that is proprietary to you, right? And when you do that, you are able to customize the behavior of the foundational model beyond what is available to everybody else. So this fine tuning That's really of the foundational model will become, will become key. And therefore, you will need to focus more on making sure that the proprietary data that you have meets a certain standard I, I want to give a, of the a, right a, quality. Yeah, a, I want to quick, I want to make sure I'm processed. Super interesting. So if I was to compare this to a human, we're like you or I, so there's a certain things of general knowledge that I have that every right. other human theoretically has. And that's not what differentiates me, but it's that combination of that when I take that with my personal experience or whatever that makes something right. I do potentially more or less valuable than someone else's so same logic with AI. That's, that's, really exactly cool. that's right. a really neat way of thinking about it. And I hadn't, I hadn't really thought about it like that. Yeah. So one of our companies, uh, Markov ML, is actually focused on building those we call data intelligence solutions yeah. for data centric AI uh, mm -hmm. right now. That's interesting. Do you, do you, how do you think data companies, uh, would they be licensing, you know, I guess, data sets to different AI companies? Will it be like one company that starts to own all this knowledge and clean it and parse it and make it more easy to index, do you think? Or is everyone going to keep trying to index it themselves? Like, what, what does the future of that look like, in, in your opinion? That's a great question. And I think there are, there are multiple kind of scenarios that might play out, right? Yeah. Um, one is uh, companies like Markov that are going to provide tools yeah. to help you understand the quality of your data, build pipelines and workflows that will result in your data set being of the right quality that then is fed to fine tuning these foundational models. Mm -hmm. Over time, the sets of algorithms that will be developed to ascertain quality of a data set will, will be built by people uh, all there, here, there, everywhere. Mm -hmm. And they might be made available on a platform like Markov using a marketplace like concept where if you have a data set that you that you obtain its proprietary data set and you want to fine tune a foundational model using that you might use 
a data quality module built by Sally that is available on a marketplace like Markov. Right mm-hmm. now, I'm, I'm not saying this is happening today, but that's sure. where things are going, right? Uh, or we, at least we see things going in that direction, especially as the as more and more people start to get familiar and, and become quasi experts in data science, machine learning, AI, mm-hmm. et cetera. The, the uh, expression, you know, data is the new oil makes me cringe a little bit now. I think I used it on a slide in 2000 eight or something once, but, it, yep. but it, now it feels a bit, bit burned out. Uh, but, um, you know, when we were talking about it then, and when I say we, I mean myself and I was in, more in the advertising world than anything else back then, uh, we were definitely talking about advertising and targeting and things like that. Yep. And you realize through the, um, whatever a, a lens of where all this is going. And if we all argue that AI, and I don't think anyone would disagree with this, that AI could potentially create a, a massive technological revolution that if you, I'm going to bring back that, that, that phrase, even though I hate it, but like you thought oil was valuable then, so to speak, think about like what the value of these data sets are now, because it's, it's not, you know, it's not just so I can target you with, you know, to buy pampers or whatever it yeah. is. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's like, it's like er, things, I guess it's things that um, data that I didn't understand would have been valuable now becomes really valuable because it's human knowledge uh, at a at a broad at a broad scale that can be used to scale. It's really it's really interesting. Um, no, absolutely. I think uh, uh, even as as far back as two thousand or as early as two thousand eight, depending on how you look at it, right? We didn't have the kind of infrastructure that we have today to be able to just store all the data that we can store today, right? True. And 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 previously. It used to that. That was the fundamental challenge. If you don't have the data, if if your if the storage architectures and the infrastructure is not able to store all the data that you could possibly want to store, mm-hmm. then forget about processing it to generate insights or or what have you, right? But now we are like storing every little scrap of data. Is, it, is this all these like NoSQL databases that have emerged over the last couple of years, like or last ten years or so, that that kind of thinking? That's they are part of the they are part of the solution, right? Uh, yeah. But but what's what's primarily driving all this, right? Is that the cloud platforms like Amazon and Google and, and Azure, their their storage solutions like S3 or Google Cloud Storage or Azure Azure Blob file system, these are in the grand scheme of things extremely cheap solutions to mm-hmm. store data. That's one of the reasons why you see companies like Snowflake doing really so it's well. It's cheap you know? and easy, basically. The perfect Correct. recipe for technology innovation. Correct. Yeah. Snowflake says, store every bit of data in my data platform. Yeah. And then when you query it, that's when you pay me. But they're, they're removing the barriers yeah. to storing as much data as you possibly can or want to. Yeah, that's fascinating. And so uh, what when you think about uh, you know, all the news and stuff i'm sure where a lot of us are consuming when you see people chatting about ai and and, and giving your your time in this in the space and you know is, is data driven ai kind of being a, an interesting phrase i hadn't really thought about until you said it today um what's what's exciting you the most lots of things actually um i'll i'll, I'll try and, and keep them keep them you know brief. i'll never put you in a box you go crazy uh, you can have more than one here no ship we're crazy yeah yeah of course of <laughs> course no I, I think i think that that as i said as i said earlier right like the application of data management and mo- modern data management and ai techniques to solve uh problems in perhaps not so sexy industries as supply chain logistics even climate change um is is super exciting right um i think the there will be no dearth of companies who will come and say oh here's another data driven solution that we've built that that is a twist on what the others were doing in advertising and marketing that is going to continue to happen for uh many 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 years yeah. to come right but i think the potential now is in looking at industries like healthcare like logistics like supply chain uh climate change etc and see the applications of data and AI in those domains, right? So that's uh, that's very exciting um, for for me. I think the uh, the ability for our ability to now 
capture and process and analyze all sorts of data is going to create, as I was saying earlier, and the, the, uh, the, is going to create this need for some sort of regulation on how data should be used, who has rights to use it, how do the owners give consent, and we're in the early innings of that, right? GDPR came out in uh, May 25th, 26th, May 25th, 2018. That's when it went into effect. So it's been like, whatever, five, it'll be five years soon. But we're still in the early innings of, of in the industry building general purpose frameworks that guide the collection, usage, processing, and analysis of uh, an activation uh, of data. So that's another thing that I'm, that I'm excited about in terms of seeing the innovation happen Along, along that dimension. Mm-hmm. And, and then in the inverse of this, what makes you the most nervous about the potential futures of AI? Look, I think the, uh, actually there's a very interesting show that is on um, Peacock. Uh, mm-hmm. It's called Capture. And uh, I highly recommend you see it. Cool, uh, check it out. It's got, two, it's got two seasons. The first season is good. The second one is just mind-blowingly awesome. Okay, especially writing this down. Because, yeah, you sold me. <laughs> especially because of the discussion we've just had vis-a-vis chat GPT, et cetera, right? The, uh, the risk is always there in the technology being misused, right? So and that's why creating the right kind of governance frameworks, et cetera, become, uh, become more and more important the challenge is how much government involvement do you want in this versus how much industry, how much of it is driven by the industry. I think that'll go to, that's going to be the interesting uh, struggle that we mm-hmm. see in the next uh, few years to come. But yeah, I mean, the, the risk of it being misused, and we're already seeing that. We've already seen I mean, lots of clear, examples. Someone's going to misuse it. We're humans. They weren't yeah. capable of having nice things without botching it. And I think there'll be how do we how do we try and balance you know balance those things? Um, yeah, I, yeah. And I think I think generally speaking, we've done a as a as as human beings or a society, civilization, what do you want to call it? Right. We've done a pretty good job of not throwing the baby out with the bathwater when it comes to mm-hmm. things like these. Um, but I'm also pragmatic enough and, and real enough to recognize that it depends on who you talk to, you know? Mm. Uh, so some people may have a very negative view on all of these technologies because of their personal experiences as well. And that's totally fair. Uh, so, uh, while we're talking about things that scare you, I think this is probably the appropriate time to ask you for your O-Ship story. And again, if this is your first time logging into O-Ship, if you're listening to us on any of our audio podcasts or tuning into the web series, uh, we always love to ask our guests who have these you know, really had great success in their careers, uh, but also ask them, what's a the moment where it's gone wrong for you, where something kind of went off the rails, as I'm prone to saying, where um, you maybe had a moment to, to course correct, to you know, get get things back on track. And maybe, um, you know, that was a, a learning moment for you. Maybe it was an inspirational moment. Or, you know, as I say frequently, maybe it's just a funny moment. It wasn't funny at the time, but probably funny now. But I'd love to hear about a, a, an oh shit moment. And I lied, by the way. I will put you in on the box on this one. You've got to give me one, one oh shit story. Uh, but uh, I will, so I, I, oh, the, floor, the floor is yours, sir. <laughs> I will just give you one. Although there are plenty I could share. I bet there is. This one, <laughs> this, this, this one actually checks a lot of the boxes that you, that you, that you mentioned. Right? So this was in the relatively early days at Crux. And uh, we had uh, one of our largest customers. And the way the Crux technology worked is we um, uh, had this piece of JavaScript code give to our customers and and they deployed it on their websites right and we would do all sorts of things uh, on their website through our through our javascript technology now you might imagine because it's running on their websites right it directly if if there were issues in our uh, in our code that could affect their revenue because it could it could it could tamper with the ads that were being shown mm-hmm. on their website and, and things like that yeah. So there was this one moment where we, and we were a typical startup, you know, moving fast and trying not to break things. Um, and there was this one moment where 
somebody inadvertently uh, ended up pushing a change to our, we used to call it the control tag, the crux control tag. And it went live on this largest customer of ours. It wasn't supposed to. And uh, it just caused, it, it caused havoc for a subset of their traffic. Yeah. And, you know, anybody who's built uh, internet technology has dealt with the uh, evil that is, or that was IE6, Internet Explorer 6. So for IE6, under certain circumstances, the ads were just not shown. And revenue, lost revenue. This was like in 2011 uh, or 12. Um, And uh, I was in a board meeting, actually, at that time, when all of this was happening. So... For three hours, I was unaware of this crisis that was unfolding. And uh, I come out of the board meeting and I open up my email and, oh my God, there are just messages galore. And so the first thing I do is I call Stephen on the phone and say, hey man, just saw the messages. I'm getting on a plane in the afternoon. Let's meet tomorrow morning and we'll talk through all of this. So that... And then what I, we got three people together yeah. and we literally built the fir- our first version of an automated testing framework, which ensured that this thing never happened. Never again. happened again. So I got on the red eye at, uh, or yeah, it was a red eye uh, at whatever, 9 p.m. or so from San Francisco, flew to New York. The team had started building all this new stuff at around three o'clock in the afternoon. By the time I met the client at 11 a.m. the next morning, we had the system ready to go so I could demo what Hardcore. we were doing <laughs> going, fo- going forward so that this never happened again. Wow. Steven is a good friend, uh, and they were a great client. Um, and so, yeah, but it's just one of those stories where uh, we, 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 were, uh, we learned the value of, of making sure that when you think you've tested, enough test one more time yeah. and the importance of putting these systems in place that allow you to control these kinds of, or prevent these kinds of mishaps right. from happening i would um, also since argue. then oh, sorry go ahead i'm just gonna say since then different mishaps have happened not these kinds of ones but you know that's what software is all about these yeah. oship moments yeah I think the, the the even more compelling lesson that i think i learned from that was the value of taking immediate action yep. and also being accountable for your mistakes. So I think, you know, um, when, when something goes wrong, whether you're in a service provider and doing so for someone else or any relationship you're in, I think when, if for me anyway, if someone says I screwed up, I'm fixing it and here's my plan to fix it. And I know the fix is there. I don't, really, I don't really hold them. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't hold grudges for that. I think it's the people yeah. that, that don't do that, that I'm like, so you got no plan, you completely shit the bed and, uh, and you're screwing my business up. And that's what, and those are the people I'm like, yeah, this, this is not, this is not, I can't keep working work. with these folks. Um, yeah, so trust, I think that's, that's trust uh, is, a good lesson. It, yeah. It takes a long time to earn trust. Yeah. But, it, but it, it erodes very, very quickly. Very fast. Yeah. I agree with that. Um, I think that's a, a, a wonderful place to, to uh, jump off for today. Uh, I could have kept talking to you about the subject for, for another hour easy. Um, but I, I want to make sure people have a chance to um, you know, find you. Uh, so what's, what's the best place if people want to find you online, they want to research more about your company or you, uh, what do you recommend that people uh, do? LinkedIn is the best. Uh, so, you know, my, my personal LinkedIn is the best, or you could go to the Superset website, superset.com, uh, to, to learn more about what we're doing at Superset, our, our company building philosophy and, and, and all of that as well. Okay. That's uh, perfect. I, I've spent some time on there. Uh, again, very, very, very interesting company. I was, uh, honored to have, uh, you on as a guest today of Vex. So it was just super interesting as I knew you'd be. Uh, I hope we get to spend more time together in the future. You're a really interesting guy. Uh, I want to thank you, and I'd also like to thank um, our audience. So all of you, that you, whether you're, again, tuning in online, uh, on video, or you're listening in on any of our podcasts, 
Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for listening and subscribing and following us. If you want to find out more about OShip Show, go to OShipShow.com. We've got links to every single platform that we stream on in case you're looking for a different experience. And the best thing you could do to support this show is give us a like, share it on your feed, comment, ask a question. A lot of time our guests uh, will will op- you know, monitor the posts and, and chime in. So um, you know, we, we're just thankful that you're out there supporting us and we want to keep bringing great content to you. And that little bit of support uh, makes it all worthwhile. Uh, so thank you to that. And again, thanks for being such an awesome guest. I really, really, really enjoyed the conversation. This was this was a lot of fun, Freddie. This was a hoot. Thank you for having me on the show. And uh, yeah, if anybody wants to reach out, uh, feel free. I'm looking forward to it. Awesome. Thank you so much. Take care, everyone. We'll see you next week on OSHIP.